come up and give a number of wonderful talks. We're going to go quickly. We're going to try and hold it to five minutes exactly before moving on to the next person. Uh, if you have any questions, kind of save them for afterwards so we can get through as many people as possible in the time that we have allotted. Sound good? All right. First up, there you go. Hello, everyone. Not only did we design a, a dev kit with 100% free software, I have uh, a USB stick I bought at FOSDEM at the Debian booth. So it actually has Debian symbol on it. So <laughs> the whole nine yards, peeps. Um, this is a talk that I'm going to give. So I'm going to steal the thunder from my colleagues about the dev kit. Um, this is a blog post, and all the details, as well as the schematics, are laid out in the blog post. So if you, if you want further details, uh, you can go there. I am giving this talk. Uh, Eric, actually, Kuzmenko, is here. So if you want to talk uh, about any of these details, you certainly can with him. I'm going to, this is great, because you know, I get to tell you all the cool stuff and all the tough questions he'll have to answer. <laughs> so we really started with an empty KiCad page. You know, it was completely empty and designed uh, a dev kit for a telephone. So modem, everything, whole nine yards. Um, the specifications are all listed, so you can see exactly what components were required, things like that. But we started from scratch. Excuse me. So, in, um, the, so the, the purpose and goal was to use 100% free software in the design. Um, and voila, you can see that the tool that we chose, or that Eric chose, uh, was not only GPLv3+, plus, but it was better than proprietary tools. That's really cool to know. Um, in designing the dev kits, um, the entirety of design was done using Git. So you can get Git revisions and you know, start your work. You don't have to start from an empty uh, CAD drawing. You can start from an already populated one, should you wish to use so. Here's an example. This is a very early uh, stage of what the development and the schematics look like. Um, obviously, it's not particularly useful, but it is, in some cases, often a proprietary file uh, when people are designing phones. This is considered a trade secret, not with us. So in addition to using KiCad, uh, um, we used other tools, a variety of tools, and the combination of the tools. Um, all this is listed out there. This is a, a direct quote. Um, Evaluating the tools as Eric went along and as uh, Nicole Farber, um, who also did a great deal of the design and, and set the requirements, um, sort of, you could say, the system architect, uh, they worked in combination and they would evaluate all the tools. And then the Gerber files, which are also often considered a trade secret. Um, these are the tools, again, we used. Here's a link to a particular checkout of or a particular Git version of the Gerber files. You may check that out if you wish. Uh, it's a tool to show Gerber files online. Very cool, great for inspiration. When you design your phone, start there and take a look at things. Um, the, Gerber the Gerber format itself is an open format for 2D binary images and PCB boards. So anytime you're going to do a PCB, you need a Gerber file. Gerber files are an open format. Cool. Here's an example of what they look like. Um, on the left is the online rendering of the Gerber file. On the right is actually uh, the Gerber files had to get put into a DCX format, then combined and layered and ultimately turned into a PDF. That is the PDF. These are the prototypes. This is how the PC board was printed. Uh, you can see the board itself and needs to get punched out at the edges. That was also done by the team. We got the PCBs, punched it out, attached uh, various devices and buses. Uh, you can see down at the bottom, following too much. Prototypes were used uh, to bring the software in a more polished state, of course. Um, and doing these prototypes allowed us to make some important fixes that would be expensive to do later on. This is a rendering of the final board. And there's the final board itself. 100% free software entire process, including me showing this to you. It can be done. Anybody can do it. It's an ethical choice. If companies say they can't do it, that's not true. They're choosing not to. Thank you. Uh, 
I got a mic, but I don't have slides to show. Um, here they are. <laughs> there was a camera for RMS's slides. I thought I'd do the same, but it's not here. So Libra Silicon, we're at an inflection point right now. We can liberate the making of chips all the way down to the glass. And we have a whole lot of players, a ton of players. There's a lot of people working at cross purposes and duplication of effort, and it's uh, lovely and chaotic. Back 100 years ago, my granddaddy had uh, a photo developing studio in his basement. And I wouldn't mind having a chip developing studio in my basement. So here I'm going to talk about LibraSilicon.com, which is a Hong Kong startup. And I will uh, mention also the Free Silicon, which is working with CERN to develop an open hardware license. I think that's very important. If there's any lawyers here, please talk to me and give me some advice. Um, this nice little logo here with the snail home CMOS. There's an IRC channel. I can't find a website. There might be one. There was a free silicon conference last week at the Sorbonne in Paris. Very interesting stuff going on. Next slide. So the interesting items are <coughs> CPU. There is a commercial outfit that has a open or liberated, or I don't know what their attitude is. I think their attitude is, let's make a lot of money. Um, Risk five CPU, but the design is available to all. Um, University of California at Santa Cruz has a fantastic RAM project. You can go to openram.soe.ucsc.edu. I will put the slides online. You'll be able to see these URLs. Libra Silicon is working on a 555 timer. So that's sort of mixed analog and digital. As for power components, I don't know of anybody working on that right now. Here is a really interesting thing. For $995, you can have an ultraviolet direct to silicon, five micron to two micron features um, saving you the trouble of making masks. Now, masks cost like 10,000 each, and you need a dozen or so to make a chip. So doing without the mask and just scribing it with ultraviolet, that's a big savings. And uh, this is sort of like the transition between uh, having to pay $10,000 for a mold to make a little plastic thing this big. And by the way, here is a chip that was made by Libra Silicon, a wafer, at the nanosystems fabrication facility at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And I was thinking it should be a door prize or something. Anyway, so $10,000 for a mold to make a little plastic thing about, you know, like the container for this wafer. Um, but now we have 3D printers. So instead of mass production, um, we have affordable within everybody's reach, small-scale production. Next slide. LibraSilicon.com, how can you help? Well, funding. The uh, nanofabrication facility charges, I don't know, 75 bucks for a mask. Oh, better than 10,000. Um, community managers, we need people to help herd the cats. Um, there's project management. Community management, okay, like the website is down. Um, the mumble certificate is broken. Um, the mailing list sign up is broken. So any volunteers, that would be nice. Um, there are some URLs that you can't see here. On GitHub, there is a Libra Silicon compiler. It's written in Haskell. Say again? 15 seconds. OK, well, we need timing-oriented synthesis, uh, SAT-based placement, access to academic foundries. Um, all right. Uh, Danny O'Brien. Danny O'Brien. 
Hey, all right then. Uh, hi, uh, FSF. I'm hey, hello. Um, I'm EFF, uh, and this talk is entitled "What Does EFF Think About PGP Anyway?" Which is going to give me flashbacks to last year, um, about May 13 uh, of last year. You may have seen, uh, if you were awake on the internet at two o'clock in the morning obviously a rare occasion for all of us, um, a huge to-do about PGP. Um, there was, on social media, there was like a big explosion, PGP was maybe broken, the EFF is telling people not to use it for the foreseeable purposes, uh, foreseeable time, um, uh, the uh, new PG developers were sort of going, no, it's, everything's fine, um, there were like Twitter accounts accusing us of being agents of the CIA, um, which is not true, if it's really insulting for me because obviously I kind of aspire to more an MI6 kind of look. Um, but, um, uh, and, uh, and people were turning on the PGP people saying you are irresponsible and it was a huge mess and then by about six o'clock in the morning you were like three levels deep in recriminations and for you waking up on the East Coast it was impossible to tell what had happened. Uh, and you know, if, you, if you're Joey Hess you found out about this three weeks later. So. Um, what actually happened, and the number one question that people come up to me is say, well, look, uh, I heard all of this stuff happened, but uh, everybody at EFF still has their PGP keys up on their um, page. You, you, I sent you this encrypted, so how are you even reading it? Aha. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, and, and should I be using PGP? Well, the short answer is, yeah, sure. Um, the long answer, or not that long, um, I'm going to explain now uh, some of the background and some of the lessons that we as an organization uh, learned. So six months before all of this hoo-ha, a bunch of uh, ger primarily German researchers came to us uh, with a problem. that They'd found a flaw in essentially the PGP ecosystem as a whole. Um, there was a vulnerability that meant that if you uh, uh, received a PGP message on a number of different clients, um, there was a possibility that your client could be used against you to decrypt previously encrypted uh, text, ciphertext. So that meant if somebody had some ciphertext that they would like to unencrypt, uh, they could send it to you and you would be like this amazing oracle of decryption, which technically is not what PGP and PGP clients are supposed to do. In fact, kind of quite the opposite. Um, why come to EFF? It's kind of a strange group to come to, in fact. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the kernel of EFF, we do a lot of things, but the kernel of EFF, if EFF, supposing there was like EFF slash Linux, um, uh, the Linux part, the kernel part, would be a law firm, which would be a strange thing to find on your USB stick, but that's kind of what we're aspiring to. So as a law firm, we have a confidentiality agreement by sort of default with the people that we talk to, um, and we often talk with coders who have found vulnerabilities. But actually, that usually applies to proprietary developers. How long have I got? Two more minutes, excellent. I just got to explain a PGP vulnerability in under 60 seconds. Um, so they came to us and we went, you know, there's not a problem here. We usually deal with the legal ramifications of a proprietary developer freaking out that you found a vulnerability and trying to sue and silence you. This is an entirely open system. That's unlikely to happen. So we talked to them a little bit and then they went away. Then they came back uh, about a week or so before their publication date and said, we've got a problem. The, the, the vulnerability isn't fixed and it's a serious problem. Um, and we looked at them and they looked at us and we went, okay, what can we do about this? Um, and we thought about it in this way. We figured that there were two groups that use PGP. And I will use them, in, term them ingeniously in a confusing PGP kind of way, public users and private users. One minute. Can I get one more minute? Okay. Public users are you. Right? Public use is you. You publicly use PGP and you love it and you're trying to prefigure the universe in which everybody uses PGP. The private users are the people who are actually potentially vulnerable to attacks. And they're much harder to reach because they don't read all the PGP news that's fit to encrypt. Um, so we had to reach out and speak to them. Uh, so we, uh, in cooperation with the researchers, the researchers said we want to Make sure that those people can fix their problem. So we're going to pre-announce. This is a terrible idea. Do never, ever pre-announce. Because pre-announcing means that all the people who know the secrets of the vulnerability 
can't speak because they're under embargo, and everybody else is freaking out. But we publicized this thing, um, and uh, we were able to reach out to that community. Um, the problem was is that the public community were going, we don't even use those clients. And it turns out that that public community is a little bit wider than you think because there are a number of different services that use PGP to protect. Is that zero or one? Zero. Okay, I'm into my minus minute. You can come and talk to me about some other lessons we've learned about this, but the main one is, is if you're an open source uh, or free software product, um, it's really good to coordinate with your wider audience as well as your core audience. Thank you very much. Next we have Daniel G. Thank you. So hopefully you all do backups. Um, and depending on how much you like to back up, uh, at least if you're using GNU Linux, you'll likely had the problem of all those virtual file systems and special mount points that you usually don't want to back up. Devs, proxys, and so on. Traditionally, you've had two options for dealing with these. You can create exclude rules for them, which most backup tools let you do, or you can exclude them automatically using the one file system option, which also quite a few backup tools have. It's supposed to automatically not cross over uh, file system boundaries, mount point boundaries. So um, of these tools, I prefer the latter because the set of file systems that I do want to back up, those are, that's a pretty stable list. It's the actual on-disk file systems the ones I'd have to recreate if I was after a disaster. Whereas the list of mount points that I don't want to back up, that's changing all the time for all kinds of reasons. Um, if you have removable media, you better, hopefully you remember to exclude slash media, or is it slash MNT, depending on how old school your user is, uh, you or your users are. Uh, if you install SnapD, that uh, package manager from Canonical, Snaps are SquashFS images that are mounted at runtime. You'll probably want to exclude those somehow, too. And then you have fuse mounts, and it's game over, because those could be anywhere, subject only to the wish whims of your users. I don't even know how you keep up with those. So it makes sense to me to whitelist those file systems that, um, that I care about and automatically exclude the rest. And the one file system option um, is supposed to do that. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work these days. Uh, there are a number of mounts that can appear on modern GNU Linux systems that will cause you trouble even if you use the one file system option as it is commonly implemented. For example, fuse mounts will haunt you again uh, because many are configured to deny access to the root user, especially to the root user for security reasons. Your backup tool, which will likely be running as root, will get EPIRM before it has a chance to detect the mount. And so it'll report that your backup has problems, which will likely mess up your monitoring system. So I've gone for a third option, bind mounts. For those not familiar, bind mounts allow you to mount an already mounted file system onto another directory. It sort of clones a mount point. But crucially for us, it does not clone any of the submounts. So if we were to create, say, a var spool backup view, and we were to bind mount our root file system onto it, like so, we will get a view of the root file system as it is on disk. Dev, proc, sys, all the rest, what fuse mounts, whatever you have, all of that has been shoved away by the kernel for you. We can, if we like, we can bind mount, bind mount any other file systems that we care about, and then we can point our backup tool at the view. And you're on your way. So I've used this trick with great success to back up my own workstations, and I recommend you consider it um, whenever you might otherwise use the one file system option in your tool. Thank you. Uh, Alex Gleason.
Hey, how's it going? I'm developing a free software video game called Vegan on a Desert Island. Just pulling up these slides. Okay, so for some context, um, oftentimes when we're having conversations about veganism, people will always go back to this one question, what would vegans do if they were stranded on a desert island? And I think that this question deserves an answer. So I've spent a tremendous amount of time and effort recently creating this free software game to answer that question. And uh, a lot of this game emphasizes design and music and storytelling. So I think that a video would be the best way to convey that. So that's what I have. So this is the title screen and then a little bit of gameplay footage. Thank you. So it's a puzzle adventure game. Uh, the game doesn't feature any violence because the protagonist is a vegan and that doesn't make any sense. So one of the challenges is how do I make a fun game that doesn't feature any violence? And I was kind of looking back at like point and click adventure games and uh, RPGs that feature a lot of puzzle elements. So that's what the gameplay is like. There's block pushing puzzles, there's um, NPCs who you have to solve their problems by finding items and giving them giving items to them. And on, on the bottom screen, uh, the beach is covered with human trash and you have to get the vacuum item and then suck the trash off the beach to make the seagulls happy. So there's two factions on this, this island. There's Evolve and Transcend. So uh, like they, they all share the common goal of wanting to end predation. They, they want the animals to stop eating each other because like the animals have become more civilized. So Evolve is supposed to be like the animals are becoming more like humans, but transcend is like, no, actually, we've already gone, like, we've reached that, and we're trying to go beyond that. Uh, but even though they have, like, the same shared goal, they're still fighting with each other, so Rachel is trying to fix their problems. Uh, and so the answer to the question, what would a vegan on a desert island do? They would probably try to fix the entire world. So that's, that's what Rachel does. Um, so Evolve is led by David Greybeard here on the left, and it's mostly featuring prey animals, whereas Transcend is like a collective that is, uh, features um, prey and predator animals. It's more diverse. Rachel has this ID card. She starts out with the USA one, and then as the game progresses, uh, she aligns with the different factions, um, and the NPCs will treat her differently depending on her faction. It was built in the Solaris game engine. It has a map editor. I highly recommend it. It's a great, vibrant community, very easy to, to get into if you're interested in game development. 
Uh, and there's, there's a number of free resource packs being developed. This one is based on a tile set by Dragon Day Platino. It's Creative Commons tile set. Um, so the goal is to emphasize design characters and story and to be an original game that, um, where everything is completely free. Uh, special thanks, well first of all, music by Cosmic Gem. These illustrations are by The Art of Silent and then the tile set is by Dragon Day Platino. Um, and then the, the engine is the Solaris engine. Special thanks to Daniel Molina, a contributor who has been putting a lot of energy and enthusiasm into the game lately. Mary Kate for coming up with the original idea uh, and to the Solaris community for all of their help. Thank you. David M. There we go. I'm always happy to be able to talk to people that have computers and I assume virtually everyone in here has either one or more plus perhaps tablets. Having all these machines raises the issue of what to do with the computer when you really don't need it for the rest of the day. Uh, some people turn them off, they let them go to sleep, they may hibernate, uh, something like that. But sometimes they're just simply left there and somebody goes and eats supper, um, comes back, looks at email, a couple of websites, that's about it. Well, a couple of years ago, my wife passed away from pancreatic cancer, and it was a long, awful experience. I don't wish it on anyone. Well, what happens with um, cancer treatment is that uh, there's chemo, uh, there is radiation, uh, there's uh, food therapy, whatever. What happens ultimately with uh, serious cancers like pancreatic is that the cancer is usually first of all discovered in a late stage and then as the chemo continues what happens is the immune system breaks down well without that immune system we're in big trouble we don't get our nutrition properly um, pathogens which normally would be controlled or not um, and cancers, of course, rage and create havoc. So what to do? Well, in, 19, in uh, 2005, I was uh, working with what's called the World Community Grid. Perhaps you're familiar with it. Back then, what was of interest was the SETI program, Search for Extraterrestrials. Perhaps you did something with them. Anyway, that project, I... Um, Soon forgot about it. I got busy with other things. I, my machines were participating with it. Um, years went by, computers changed. Finally, I have some newer computers. In fact, I now have a lab. And so I thought, well, let me check with the World Community Grid and see if they're doing anything that is in medicine. And I came upon these medicine projects, which I've listed on the board here, which you may not be able to read. but. The first one is uh, the Microbiome Immunity Project. And that is a project run out of Massachusetts General Hospital, a broad institute at MIT, um, University of California at San Diego, and Washington State University. And they're in a consortium to try to figure out the proteins for all of the bacteria inside the body and on the outside. Uh, the human body has approximately uh, 22,000 uh, 22, um, genes which code for proteins. Uh, these bacteria have enough uh, genomic material uh, to create 3 million proteins. And those proteins have functions that even affect how your moods work in your brain. So uh, I thought, well, let me try the Microbiome Immunity Project, and I also took on a couple of others, uh, the TB, Help Stop TB, and man Mapping Cancer Markers. Well, so far my machines are, are running okay. I have one of them with me at this conference, and it's not doing its research 
today or yesterday. Uh, but I have two back at the lab um, that are running full time around the clock. Uh, and I checked on them today to make sure they're doing their thing. And then I have a travel, uh, another business machine, which I have off in my lab. Um, all those machines will be back on again, and about 16 work projects are being uh, simultaneously worked on at any one given moment. Um, approximately 30 of them are posted back to the World Community Grid. Uh, once done, new ones are downloaded, and immediately the work is started on them. They take between an hour and a half up to 12 to 15 hours to do a work unit, depending on how serious the protein folding is at that point. We don't? Thank you very much. Try to get involved. Christopher F. All right, hello. Uh, my name's Franco, and this is Fang. Uh, we're UC Berkeley students, so we've been working on a mobile application for the Free Software Foundation. Yes. Um, and uh, we're part of a Blueprint, so we're a team of UC Berkeley students. Uh, we develop software pro bono, and we promote technology for social good. Um, so in order to take on these projects for nonprofits, we have uh, teams with project leader, developers, designers. And for the Free Software Foundation, we had uh, multiple problems that we were uh, attempting to provide solutions. So currently we have a mobile application and one of the uh, components that we built out is the news stream. So we're incorporating the FSF news, RSS feed, and GNU social uh, into the application. So here's sort of the, the screens that we have here. And we also have donations. Yeah, so one of the features that we really wanted to build for this app was to make donations easy and simple for users. So to use an example, let's say one day you experience your right to free software being violated and you want to support the Free Software Foundation. Right now, you could make a donation, but that's a lengthy process every single time that requires you to fill in your name, credit card information, and so forth. And so what we did was build an action item where, so right here you can see a standard donation flow. But the idea is that once you donate for the first time, you would have the option of making repeat donations at the press of a button, simplifying the process and removing that lengthy process every single time. Next, taking a step back and looking at the implementation uh, for this project, basically we use React Native to build the mobile app. Uh, for the, the back end is built using Go and Ruby on Rails, and we use them about three APIs, one of them being CVCRM, which is something that's used by FSF as well. And of course, all of this starts from an understanding of what FSF's needs are, and so for that, I'll pass it on to Franco, who will share more about this. Okay. Uh, so to make the, these projects usable, we emphasized a lot on user research, design. I became an FSF member, went into the forums, did an audit of all the different resources that the Free Software Foundation has on their website, and then we distilled it to the current application. Cool, so on a closing note, just to reach out to any nonprofits that might be in this auditorium, um, we invite you to work with us, uh, and 
our applications open on the 6th of June, but between now and then, we have a mailing list that you can sign up for that is found on this address. And what that would do is it would keep you in, updated and in the loop for, for any news. But the thing we really want to emphasize and the thing that we talked about throughout this process is how we really work very closely with, uh, sorry, closely with the nonprofits that we work with to understand your needs to ensure that what we build is something that both addresses those needs and uh, is useful and valuable to you. And so I want to thank you all for your time. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to uh, talk to me and Franco afterwards, or also reach out to us at the address. Thank you. And also, we, uh, we have a working prototype, so feel free to approach us so we can start. We want to directly talk to all of you to make sure that you know, what we're building is not in a vacuum. It's, it's part of the community. Devin Yu. So um, I worked uh, together with the Free Software Foundation about, well, over the course of maybe six months total. But um, the main action was um, within two weeks, uh, about starting three weeks ago, um, we brought uh, free software into the public schools. Um, and uh, I'll just show you a little bit of what we did. So um, I'm calling it Mission Possible. Um, we brought 25 Respect Your Freedom laptops into um, these two schools. Um, first of all, it, uh, we had to prepare the laptops, and if FSF intern Valesio is in the room, he should stand up and we should thank him. <laughs> like, yes, we can cheer him on, even if he's not here. <laughs> Here's some more. <laughs> um, so within a week, he prepared 25 of these laptops so that the um, whole classroom experience could be 100% free. Um, they were running uh, Triskel and Labre Boot, and here's a, a picture of two of them in um, one of the classes. Um, here is um, some of the staff members. Uh, the w staff that um, worked directly um, were um, I mean, F, uh, Valesio as an intern. Um, this is Ruben Rodriguez, and we had Michael McMahon um, uh, all helping out in the classroom. <coughs> um, we, uh, we did uh, visual programming with uh, a program called Music Blocks, which I've been working on with uh, Walter Bender um, as part of uh, Sugar Labs, which is a software um, Freedom Conservancy um, member project. And so here's Valesio in the classroom um, with uh, a few of the students. Um, here's uh, just uh, one, one little picture of uh, some of the code that they were working with. Um, it's a visual programming language for music. So the main container is um, time. These are eighth notes. One over eight is an eighth note. Um, and these are drums um, that happen over time. Um, I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty because it would take a long time, but you can go to musicblocks.sugarlabs.org and you can try it. Um, um, it's licensed under the AGPL. Um, so what did we learn? Um, we learned um, some concepts that are shared between code and music. Um, believe it or not, um, they meet very well. Um, at this place um, in the middle. And uh, these cups represent um, musical form. This is uh, hot cross buns. And uh, then they represent um, uh, functions in computer programming. And that's what the kids started with. Um, and here's the kids problem solving, reading graphs, um, learning how to turn that into uh, code. Um, and then the other side of what we wanted to do with the kids was um, t 
teach them a little bit about um, what software freedom is. <laughs> um, we didn't have a lot of time in the classroom, um, so it was kind of a big challenge. Um, but my wife, who's a professional artist, helped me um, create these um, nice little diagrams so that you know, with the limited time we had, we could give them some handouts um, that t talked about the four freedoms um, to kind of help facilitate explaining this thing that might be unfamiliar to these kids. Um, here's the kids reading um, those uh, handouts. And one of the things they did was they made projects with music blocks and shared that with their friends who then, um, you know, made um, contributions to the original code and then reshared those back um, to the original student. Um, we got some feedback from the kids. What is something that you learned? Um, some of the answers were, I learned the four freedoms. I learned that I can contribute to the making of a website, music blocks itself. Um, and I learned how to music code. I couldn't say that last one better myself. <laughs> Um, here's one of the principals. This is a school in Roxbury. Um, we're going to donate five of those laptops to their school. This was a school that was in the newspaper for not having a library about two years ago. And now they'll have five fully free computers. And that's it. Thank you. All right, Patrick, I can give you a two minutes. You wow us in two. Awesome, thank you. I'm Patrick McDermott, and full, full disclosure, I'm from Libiquity, you sell these, but uh, for anyone who heard me at the members meeting, this may be a repeat, so I'll lead with an alarmist claim. We're facing an existential crisis, basically, in hardware that works with free software and firmware. One commonly, er commonly known area is CPUs. Anything Intel past 2008 has a coprocessor called the management engine or the converged security engine that runs applications for things like remote access and audio and video DRM. And AMD past 2013 has something similar called the uh, platform security processor. And it's impossible to fully replace these due to cryptographic signatures and hashes, although some researchers have been able to remove some modules of these. But basically, for that and other reasons, Intel and AMD are dead ends for freedom. So we need to move to other architectures, as I think RMS said once in a previous Libre Planet conference, like ARM and Open Power. But RISC-V possibly someday in the future, but that's not currently really a replacement for Intel or AMD. But it is useful in microcontrollers, and that's another area where we have a lot of work. Things like graphics processors. Currently, you know, any NVIDIA GPUs since Maxwell arch microarchitecture have signed firmware, and Intel since Skylake and AMD, Radeon, all have firmware that has signatures that can't be replaced. And for Wi-Fi, we're stuck now with 802.11n because AC now all requires non-free firmware to be uploaded to them. And even just basic USB, anything USB 3.0 or later now, non-free firmware updated from the boot firmware. Told this time. So I wish we could get more people in, but that's it. Fast and informative. If we could just give a quick round of applause to all of our speakers. Thank you.